संस्थापकाय च धर्मस्य सर्वधर्मस्वरूपिणे अवतारवरिष्ठाय रामकृष्णाय ते नम Revered monks and nuns, devotees and friends, we are gathered here this evening for a for this talk on Sri Ramakrishna, because today happens to be the one hundred and eighty-first birth anniversary of Sri Ramakrishna, birthday of Sri Ramakrishna, and we are going to celebrate it in a big way, of course, this week on Sunday. so everybody is welcome to attend the day long celebrations which we will have on sunday but today we will take a look at the life and teachings of sri ramakrishna especially how do we live our lives in the light of ramakrishna thanks to the wonders of modern technology you can now know what's going on on the other side of the world at the click of a mouse and uh, this afternoon i was looking up the belur math website where which is the the main monastery of our order which is in on uh, near the ganga in calcutta across from calcutta and today of course there was a huge celebration usually around 50 to 60000 people come on this day um and the general secretary of our order he began his talk which we could hear on the on the website uh and he said that imagine on this day hundreds of thousands of people millions of people across the globe are thinking about sri ramakrishna and what a wonderful thought that is that when so many people think about such a noble such a spiritual such a pure subject and why are they thinking about it is something that attracts them and something that they want we want something from this sri ramakrishna phenomenon which can transform our lives which can uplift our lives which can give light to our lives so that's how he began his talk and i thought it's really wonderful um you see india is an interesting place um it's the oldest continuous civilization existing on this planet now and uh, thousands and thousands of years ago the greatest thinkers of that civilization made a discovery they looked within and they found within mortal man something immortal within our limited frames they found something infinite something that had the solution to the problems of life and they sang out in beautiful vigorous melodious sanskrit we know, know not who said these words but these are immortal words swami vivekananda was fond of repeating them when he came to the united states more than 100 years ago often he would chant these verses these mantras in melodious sanskrit and then translate shrinvantu vishve amritasya putra listen ye children of immortal bliss i have found the infinite radiant like a thousand suns forever beyond darkness and the one who finds this when you find this you go beyond the darkness the limitation the suffering beyond death the limitation which surrounds our this little human life we go beyond that that is the promise of religion and spirituality he says there is no other way to attain this all other ways what we try in our world the secular ways through power and pleasure and science and technology and art and learning all are limited all are good but they have their limits now it is not just india which found this truth this truth was found in india in the middle east and in many places across the world even in primitive societies um they they came across this truth wherever there has been human civilization someone or the other they have stumbled or they have cultivated this truth but what happened in india was they went crazy over this <laughs> india is a god crazed land um will durant write something to that effect that uh, the people in india are 
crazy about religion and spirituality. The, the energies of the race were devoted, were devoted to finding newer and newer ways of tasting God. You know, Sri Ramakrishna was an embodiment of this phenomenon. He tasted God in different ways. How different religions, people of different cultures, people of different persuasions have found God in meditation, in devotion, in, in knowledge, uh, in different religions. Swami Tapasyanji writes, he was a spiritual glutton. <laughs> Sri Ramakrishna. But that is true of India as a whole. When Swami Vivekananda was here in this country more than 100 years ago, there is this reminiscence by a young lady who heard him t speak in one of the towns in, in, in the United States. And he says, and she writes that when he walked past, she was impressed by his regal bearing. And, and he, she asked her friend, another young lady, who is he? And she replied that uh, he's Swami Vivekananda and in India he is regarded as a prophet. And this young lady asks, you mean like the prophets of the Old Testament? And she says, yes, like that. But that was so long ago. Are there any prophets in the world now? And this other young lady, I don't know who she was, she, she replies, in India it is always the age of the prophets. Uh, so this has been the history of India. And they have cultivated this knowledge in so many ways. Swami Vivekananda says, in the West, religion was fixed and society grew. Society was set free to grow. And in India, society was bound down by caste and a thousand social rules, but religion was set free to go, grow. So you have a variety of ways of worshipping God, with form and without form, through love, through rituals, through knowledge, through meditation, and different forms. And all this was cultivated for thousands of years. Now imagine, imagine all of this knowledge, all of this wisdom, all of this experience, packed, compressed into one human frame. It's unthinkable. That's why Christopher Isherwood writes, this is a story of a phenomenon. When he begins his book, Sri Ramakrishna and his disciples, Ramakrishna and his disciples, he writes, this is a story of a phenomenon. It is truly a phenomenon, unparalleled in human history, unparalleled in Indian history also. That was the life of Ramakrishna, who lived in one life the entire religious history of humanity. Not just India, but the whole of humanity. Sri Ramakrishna says, see, Swami Vivekananda writes about Sri Ramakrishna. He was the embodiment of the Vedas. By Vedas, we must, we must note that Swami Vivekananda meant not only the spiritual books of the Hindus, the scriptures of the Hindus, but he meant the accumulated spiritual wisdom of humanity. All of spiritual wisdom is Veda for Swami Vivekananda. And he says Sri Ramakrishna was the embodiment of the Vedas. Swami Vivekananda did not write much about Sri Ramakrishna, strangely enough. He wrote so much. There are nine volumes of his works. Letters and lectures and interviews and articles, even a few small books. He wrote prodigiously and uh, spoke and wrote but not much about Sri Ramakrishna. When he was asked what he thought about Sri Ramakrishna, his own guru, why didn't he speak much about Sri Ramakrishna? Swami Vivekananda said, with a touch of sadness, he says that after, in Bengali, Jibon Pati Koryo, after the most intense spiritual practices in my life, I still haven't been able to understand a bit about Sri Ramakrishna. I don't, I don't understand Sri Ramakrishna. He's so vast. He says, the ocean of spirituality that was Sri Ramakrishna, by taking a drop of that, of that ocean, man becomes divine. Man is divine. The human becomes divine with one drop of the ocean of spirituality that was Ramakrishna. He says that Sri Ramakrishna, according to the capacity of the person, he let that person know something of himself according to the capacity of that person. So each person understood Sri Ramakrishna in a different light. That's why Swami Vivekananda didn't dare. Somebody asked him, why don't you write a book about Sri Ramakrishna? And he said, Sheep Gurtiki Banorkur. In Bengali, it's a peculiar phrase. It means 
they make little images of gods and goddesses in Bengal, uh, in, in India, and making an image of Shiva. So he says, and, and a child or a clumsy person, when they try to make this image, they might end up in making an image of a monkey. <laughs> I mean, a very clumsy image, that we, that's what it means. So he says, I might start trying to speak about Ramakrishna, but I'll end up making a caricature because it's, it's simply beyond my capacity. Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda says this. His disciple, Sharad Chandra, once asked him, Do you consider Ramakrishna to be an avatar, an incarnation of God? And Swami Vivekananda said to him, What do you mean by an avatar? What do you mean by an avatar? What do you understand by an avatar? And Sharad Chandra said, Why? Like Rama or Krishna or Jesus or uh, Chaitanya, like them? And Swami Vivekananda said, I know Ramakrishna to be greater than all of them. It is a very bold statement to make. And he says, he repeats it. I know it. I do not, it's not that I just believe it. It's not that I just claim it. I know it to be true. He says another place in, in colloquial Bengali. Amitake avatarer bab bole jani. I know him to be the source of all avatars. In fact, there's a, there's a say, place where Sri Ramakrishna talks about his own experiences. And he says that, I saw a figure come out of this body and say, I juge juge I, I, in, I incarnate myself in, eight, in ages. In different ages I come. That means God comes in different ages. So he says this, this, thing, this phenomenon Sri Ramakrishna saw emanating from his body. He had this kind of an experience. Sri Ramakrishna himself says there are many avatars, incarnations of God. This is something that is well accepted in Hinduism, that God can come in different human forms. And so that's why the incarnation of Jesus is very easily accepted by the Hindus. It's, it's entirely possible that God comes in human forms once in a while to show us the light, to show us the path. And there are many such incarnations. Sri Ramakrishna himself quotes um, a little story where um, Krishna is walking with Arjuna and they come to a strange tree where Arjuna sees lots of little blackberries, blackberries, bunches of blackberries hanging in the tree, on the tree. And Sri Krishna says, what do you see? So I see bunches of this little fruit, this blackberries there. So no, look closely. And Arjuna walks closer and he sees they're not blackberries, they are bunches of little Krishnas hanging on the tree. Which means, he's saying that God incarnates in many forms and has been incarnating for in every age of humanity, many of which we may not know also. The Holy, uh, Holy Mother herself mentions this. That uh, in Bengali she says, Manush to Bhagawan ki bhulei ache. Uh, human beings, we, we, f we generally are forgetful of God. But out of his own compassion, the Lord incarnates himself from time to time and shows us the path. The Holy Mother says this. And of course the famous verse in Gita where Krishna openly declares himself to be an incarnation of God. Yada yada hi dharmasya hanir bhavati bharata abhyutthanam adharmasya tadatmanam srijamyaham Whenever dharma, religion declines, whenever religion declines, and irreligion, materialism, rears its head, I incarnate myself again and again to establish religion, to uplift the holy and transform the wicked. I do that from age to age I come. And uh, this is a famous oft quoted verse from the Bhagavad Gita. Sri Ramakrishna himself, you know, uh, sometimes uh, we, we read about the story which is very well known. He told Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda was a young boy at that time, Narendranath. Towards the end of his life, Sri Ramakrishna, when he was stricken with cancer and lying on his deathbed, and the young disciples were nursing him, and Naren, who later became Swami Vivekananda, was sitting by his bedside seeing this sick old person. And saying that if he can claim to be God now, to be to an incarnation of God now in this condition, I will believe him. The moment he thought this, Sri Ramakrishna turned to him and said, 
he who was Rama, he who was Krishna, is now in this body, Ramakrishna. Do you still doubt it? You still, you still doubt it. But it's not that he just told Narendranath. Swami Abhedananda, another, another of the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, one who spent the longest time in this country. In fact, his voice is the only one that we, we have um, authentically on, on record, preserved. Because he was invited to give a talk on the birth anniversary of Sri Ramakrishna, the 100th birth anniversary of Sri Ramakrishna, uh, in 90, on 1936 on All India Radio. And the talk he gave has been recorded on a phonograph at that time, and now it's available. And there, I have heard him, I heard the talk, it's in Bengali, and he says so clearly, how many times we have heard from his own lips, that he who was Rama, he who was Krishna, is now in this body, Ramakrishna. So that means, it's something that Sri Ramakrishna often and openly told many people, at least his closest disciples. The first thing that we learn from Sri Ramakrishna is that God, Brahman, Atman, liberation, salvation, Nirvana is not theoretical. It's not something you read about. It's not something you believe in. It's something to be experienced. Not after death, not a post-mortem realization, salvation. Right now, one can experience God. One can see God. This is the first and most forceful way in which Sri Ramakrishna has established religion in our age. You see, as time goes, people become more concerned with the externalities of religion and lose touch with the core of religion, which is spirituality. I remember this little cartoon in a newspaper. This is a gentleman um, in a church showing people around the new facilities in the church. Here we have a community hall and here we have a sports facility and here is the library and here is the play uh, you know, for little kids for the, so that the kids can play here. And the people who are donors, you know, they are walking with the father and they are looking interested and somebody asks, excuse me, but what about God? <laughs> and he looks surprised. Oh, God, that's so medieval. We dispensed with this time in the, you know, we dispensed with God. So what happens is we get more and more engrossed with externals. It happens in all religions and no, no more so than in Hinduism. It's tremendous emphasis on caste rules, on food, on little rituals and a proliferation of all that. And the core of religion is forgotten. And slowly people begin to doubt whether it's true. This, all these things in the scriptures have said, you can see God in this form and you do this spiritual practice and you get this result. Is it true at all? People start doubting it. And that's when an incarnation of God comes and demonstrates in life, in practice, that it is possible. That God exists and God can be experienced. And the world gets this new influx, recharge of divinity. A few months ago, before I came to the United States, I was in Belurmat, and a Swami, who is from the southern state of Karnataka, in India, he was uh, telling me a, a recent saint from Karnataka who has passed away, but he was just maybe 50 or 60 years ago, he passed away, who had nothing to do with us, with the Ramakrishna order. Now his letters in Kar Karnada have been translated and published. I don't know if they haven't translated, but they've been published. And this Swami has read it. He was telling me, it's incredible. This person, before he became a monk, he took to spiritual life. As a young person, how did he writes about how he came to a belief in God? Why did he come and how did he come to a belief in the existence of God? And he writes, three things convince me about the existence of God. The first two are general. One is, he says, this universe. I always felt that it must have a cause. That's one. And that's fairly general. Every religion says that. The second thing he said was, because the scriptures, the Vedas, the scriptures of the Hindus say so. So scriptural proof. But the third thing is most important. He just writes one word. The third thing which convinced him finally about the existence of God. He writes one word, Ramakrishna. Now I found that very powerful. You see, the way we put it is, 
Ramakrishna's realization proves that there is God or convinces us or Sri Ramakrishna's teachings convince us about the existence of God. But what this person says, just Ramakrishna. The phenomenon called Ramakrishna. God comes in every age to, as an incarnation to re-establish religion. It's just the phenomenon of Sri Ramakrishna in front of our eyes. When we read about his life, when we think about it, that this was scarce a hundred years ago. When Mahatma Gandhi passed away on his funeral procession, there was an American correspondent who was giving a commentary on the radio. And he said famously that uh, in a few generations, the generations will pass and people will scarce believe that such a one of flesh and blood walked this earth. And this is true of Sri Ramakrishna. That the phenomenon itself convinces us that what he says must be true. All that we read in the scriptures and in the different religious texts, they would remain as interesting theories, academic studies, clever philosophies. But the power which convinces us that it must be true, it comes from the life of a person, of somebody like Sri Ramakrishna. A certain power is set into motion in this age through his life. So that is realization. He went direct to God. One of the Swamis, Tapasyanji, writes, he took the castle of God by storm. He cried and wept and like a baby, like a child, crying for his mother. It, um, you know, there are so many vivid descriptions. In the temple garden of Dakshineshwar, he was a priest to the Divine Mother Kali. And he would pray, he would meditate, he would repeat the name of Kali, he would spend nights in meditation alone in the jungle nearby. As the day passed and the sun set, across the river, the, the Ganges, they would find, people would find this young priest weeping bitterly, rubbing his face on the rough ground till it bled and crying, Mother, another day has passed, I have not seen you. Alas, days have passed but I, I have not seen you. And people thought, well, maybe he's weeping for his mother. His mother must be in the village somewhere and maybe that's why he's very attached to his mother. That's why he's crying maybe. They did not understand. He was crying for God. So the realization of God is possible. That is first. And then he took to spiritual practice, sadhana, spiritual practice. As the Swami said, like a spiritual glutton. There was nothing that he did not try. If anything he heard of this, this in this way you can realize God, he tried it. And with the most intense concentration. So Vivekananda says, the power of attachment and detachment was manifested to an extraordinary degree in this person. He could pour himself like a, you know, emptying a bucket into another bucket, again pour himself out into another form. So he practiced the different bhavas in Hinduism. Shanta, the peaceful bhava, where the sages of Hinduism regarded existence, consciousness, bliss. He did that in meditation. He would sit for meditation. The descriptions are vivid. They are meant for us when we meditate. He says, when I sat for meditation, I would feel the joints of my hands locking. He could actually feel clicks, sounds coming. They would lock into position. It's just the mind. The mind is so powerfully trained. They would lock into position until I finish the meditation. They will not unlock. I cannot get up from there. Sometimes I would feel this person coming out and with threatening me with a trident that you will not move from your seat until you have finished your meditation, and so on. The Shanta Bhava, the Dasya Bhava, O Lord, Thou art my Lord, I am Thy servant. The, the, the attitude of a servant of God. Hanuman had that attitude towards Rama. In Hanuman Chalisa you find Rama Kaja Kari Veku Atura, one who is eager to do the work of the Lord. That's an attitude. I am eager to serve the Lord as long as I live. So, Dasya Bhava, Sakya Bhava, the law, attitude of, of the God as a friend. And Sri Ramakrishna practiced all of these. Vatsalya Bhava, of course, mostly his attitude was sometimes like a mother to the child. God is the child and I am the mother. That is an attitude in Hinduism. Or the other way around. God is my mother and I am the child. Because in Hinduism, God can be both father and mother. It can be both masculine and feminine too. And the Madhura Bhava, the, the idea of love, God as lover. He practiced the main, all the main streams of Hinduism. Of course, he was himself 
Shakta in the sense that he was, Kali was his Ishta de, uh, Devi. But, and of course, whole life he prayed and worshipped worshipped Kali. But also Vaishnava religion. The worship of Rama, the worship of Krishna, the bhavas of Sri Chaitanya, all manifest to a complete, to, to a fullest extent in the life of Sri Ramakrishna, we find that. The Shaiva religion, worship of Shiva, the 12 Shiva temples in Dakshineshwar, they bear witness. He used to go there and worship Shiva. We, re we read on how on Shivaratri day, which we celebrated just a few days ago, the little Ramakrishna, Gadadhar, there was um, a play staged in the village, a traditional Hindu play, uh, when somebody dresses up like Shiva. Like we had Shiva here, dancing at the fourth watch in the night in the, on Shivaratri day. Well, that was a little boy dressed up as Shiva. And we find Gadadhar, the little Ramakrishna, Gadadhar, going into spiritual ecstasy, into, into Samadhi dressed as Shiva, identifies so much with Shiva. The Shaiva faith, not only Hinduism, not only the varied sects of Hinduism, but other religions which had come to his notice, Islam and Christianity. He wanted to know, there were British, and it was Calcutta was the capital of the British Empire at that time in India. And the British were always there, all around. And he said, how do the white people worship God? I want, take me to a church, I want to see. And he used to go into ecstasy. He had a vision of the uh, of Mother Mary. He had a vision of of um, of the Christ. And he spent days immersed in the thought of the Christ. He did not mix and match. Little bit of Hinduism, little bit of Christianity. Not like that. When he would do that, he would completely cut off. He would uh, practice only that particular bhava attitude. For example, when he practiced Islam. He actually removed all the pictures of Hindu gods and goddesses from his room. He would not go to his beloved Kali temple. He would just pray like a devout Muslim and dress like that. And he, and he had, a, had a, the highest spiritual experience in Islam too. And Tantra with Bhairavi Brahmani, some of the most difficult practices, concluding with the worship of his own wife as the Divine Mother, the Shodashi Puja and going into ecstasy while worshipping his own wife as the Divine Mother. Advaita Vedanta, where the, the Shankarite monk Totapuri came. And there are so many stories. Totapuri was going by and he saw Ramakrishna sitting on the banks of the river Ganga and saw him and immediately recognized this person to be a fit candidate for non-dual knowledge. And he went and said, I'm going to teach you non-dual Vedanta, Advaita. And Ramakrishna said, just a minute, let me ask my mother. So he went and came back and Totapuri thought maybe he's gone to ask his human mother, what else could he have thought? And Sri Ramakrishna, and he taught and so he found Sri Ramakrishna a remarkable uh, uh, student. Within three days, he attained Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Totapuri says, what took me 30 years or 40 years of intense spiritual practice, who is this person who goes straight into Nirvikalpa Samadhi? Uh, he had a little bit of difficulty after instruction from Totapuri. Uh, he would sit and his God, mind would merge and he would get a vision of his uh, chosen ideal, Kali. And Totapuri said, you have to go beyond that, beyond forms. And then Sri Ramakrishna said, I took the, the sword of knowledge and cut Kali into two pieces and everything merged into one existence consciousness bliss. And he remained in Nirvikalpa Samadhi. But he taught his guru also. That's another interesting thing. Even Totapuri would learn from Ramakrishna. Totapuri delighted in getting this amazing pupil. But he was, of course, he was critical about dualistic religion. Sri Ramakrishna would sit and listen to Totapuri like a, like a little child. And when the sun would set, it's a time to take the name of the Lord. And he would start clapping and say, Rama, Rama, Krishna, Krishna. Hari. And Totapuri would get annoyed. He would say in Hindi, Kya roti pa, chapati bana pakate ho? Chapati thokte ho? In, in Hindi, it means in North India and at, at dusk in villages, you find uh, people who make the chapati with their hands, the, the bread, they, they do this. And so when Sri Ramakrishna used to clap hands and sing the name of the Lord, Totapuri would uh, sort of disparagingly, he knew what he was doing, but he was disparagingly say, are you making chapatis? What is this you are doing? You have attained the highest non-dual knowledge. And what is this you are doing? I remember my, I mean, it's not at all relevant, but making the chapatis, I was with such monks in the Himalayas about 10 years ago, 
And at night I decided I would sit with them and around the fire at night, around this time, little earlier, because it's very cold there and you sit around the fire, there's no central AC or heating or anything like that. There's no electricity. Now they have a little bit of electricity in some places, but no electricity at that time. <laughs> and we sat around that and some one person was making the, um, they call it tikkar. So they burned the roti there. And they brought it to the Swami to show him. The senior Swami was sitting with us. And he touched it and he said, Mulayam, it's soft. Mulayam to Sedji Lokhata. This is the, 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 the rich people of the plains, you know, ordinary people, rich people, they eat soft food like this. You burn it so that it becomes so hard that you can break your tooth on it. And I was scared, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't, I, I, I can't eat that. Another Swami told me that, um, well, uh, Swami, you're going to eat a ticker and you not get a stomach upset, it can't, it's not possible, it, they, they go together. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sri Ramakrishna immediately said, I'm taking the name of the Lord, and you're saying I'm making chapatis? And he really taught um, Totapuri. One day Totapuri was... Um, sitting and meditating and he used to meditate throughout the night. There's even a story, a ghost story there. There was a tree in which a ghost lived, a very terrible ghost and would scare people. And Todapuri was sitting there meditating and the ghost came down from the tree and stood in front of Todapuri trying to scare him and Todapuri opened his eyes and said, Oh, who are you? Come sit and meditate on Brahman. And the ghost ran away. Everybody runs away when you ask them to meditate. Even, even ghosts, ghosts run away. But this very Totapuri was taught the greatest lesson of his life by Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, when he was suffering from an illness and he decided to give up the body and he tried to drown his body in the Ganga but he could not do that. He walked across the Ganga at night to the other shore and he came back and he couldn't find enough water to even drown the body and then he realized what Sri Ramakrishna was saying. That in the world of relativity it is all the play of Shakti. And he went and bowed down in the temple of Kali. And this happened to other gurus also. Those who taught Sri Ramakrishna were also uplifted in their own spiritual paths by him. At least thrice his own Ishtadevata, personal deity, um, appeared before him and said, you stay in Bhava Mukha. This is another unique feature of Sri Ramakrishna, which we do not find in the lives of ordinary spiritual practitioners. So Bhava Mukha, there is no translation for that. It is something like there is the formless existence consciousness bliss which is transcendent beyond this universe. And there is the immanent aspect of God which appears as this universe. And Bhava Mukha is some, something like the borderline between the transcendent and the immanent. Where Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna could easily go into high spiritual moods and he would often do that. If you read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. If you read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, you will find so many times, almost every day, two, twice, thrice, number of times he goes into samadhi, into spiritual ecstasy, different kinds of ecstasies. And almost anything and everything could throw him into samadhi. Um, it's just the opposite for us, you know. We try our best to take our mind to God, nothing it doesn't stick there and it slides down. He would have to try to come down. He would be in samadhi and then he would mumble, I want a glass of water or something like that, so that his mind comes down to this plane. And it's just the other way around. He has to strive to come down to our plane and we have to strive to go up to uh, that plane. Anything could throw him. Uh, one of the most amazing stories I found was somebody closed an umbrella. Immediately he went into Samadhi. I read that somewhere. But, you know, he gathered it. Just the concept of gathering in the mind. The umbrella closing suddenly. Immediately his mind went into Samadhi. Um, he used to love the young disciples so much. And uh, somebody scolded him for that. You are a saint. Think about God. Why are you thinking about Narain and Rakhal and others? And Sri Ramakrishna said, Is that so? Alright. I will take off my mind from all of that and think about God only. Immediately he went into such an ecstasy. Um, with his, I said, all the hair on his hand and including his beard, all, all of it stood on the end. And, and completely absorbed. The person who was criticizing him was scared. And he said, no, 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 no. You do whatever you please. There is nothing to, there is no, no, no one to compare with you. 
you can think about whatever you like. So Bhava Mukha, one aspect is the ability to go from the immanent aspect to the transcendent aspect and come back again. That's one aspect. Another aspect Swami Bhuteshanandaji has pointed out is that staying at that, that stage, he got an insight into all different paths of spiritual practice. That is why people who came to him, he immediately understood what is the ideal for this person, how this person can realize God. And he would instruct each person and encourage them according to their own spiritual path. To a Vaishnava, he would speak about the love of Krishna. To a Shakta, he would speak and sing songs of Kali. To a Vedantin, he would talk about Advaita Vedanta, non-dual Vedanta, Brahman being real and the world being false and the reality within and so on. And he would do that. Of course, there's one thing he would do all the time. After encouraging each person in his or her own path, he would also tell them, don't be dogmatic, don't be narrow. And he said, other paths are, also, paths are also true. So this is another aspect of Bhava Mukha, knowing the different spiritual paths and uh, how to encourage, stimulate the spiritual growth of different aspirants in their own paths. Because usually we find great spiritual sages and saints in history in different cultures, they're usually limited to one path. So if you go to them, they, will, they can guide you along the path in which they have walked, they have been trained, and they have attained illumination. And they can guide you there with a little bit of freedom here and there. But Sri Ramakrishna could do it for people who came from different traditions. Each of them saw in him their own ideal. So the Vaishnavas saw him in, in the Vaishnava ideal. They found in him Chaitanya. They said, you are the new manifestation of Chaitanya. And the Vedantin saw him in him a great non-dualist. And the Tantrika saw him in the person who has attained, you know, the, uh, who has realized Brahman and Kali together. And so on. Today I remember Swami Suhitananditi, who was giving a speech today in India across the world. And in that speech, I, he told a very interesting story. He was the attendant, the sevaka, for Swami Premeshanandaji a disciple of the Holy Mother. And towards the end of Swami, uh, Swami Premeshanji's life, Swami Suhitanji said, he told us a little story. He said, one day, Premesh Maharaj, Swami Premeshanandaji, Premesh Maharaj said, I wanted to l write something on the, um, the, the travels of Gadadhara. In Bengali he said, Gadadhara Brahman Kahini. The travels, Gadadhara is the childhood name of Ramakrishna. And Suhitanandaji did not understand. He said, what do you mean the travels of Gadadhara? What, what travels? And then Pramesh Mahat said, don't you see? Every day he is traveling from the form to the formless. From, you know, Kshara to Akshara to Purushottama. From the, what he means is it the, in the 15th chapter in Bhagavad Gita. He says, here is this person who is a simple Brahmin priest from a village in, in Bengal. The human aspect of Sri Ramakrishna, which was also very strong and prominent, the human aspect. And sometimes he is, a, uh, he is giving a sp spiritual instruction, the consciousness with Maya, the Akshara aspect. He is teaching as, as an incarnation or as a uh, guru for thousands of people. So many people are being uplifted to God realization. And sometimes he is absorbed in the, his own Purushottama nature. Moving across, the, these, this is another aspect of Bhava Mukha. Uh, usually, aspirant spiritual sadhakas cannot do that, but Sri Ramakrishna could do it at will. This works only in Bengali, but I, I must tell you this. In the Bengali Katham, in a gospel, there's a stylized way of writing. M writes, whenever Sri Ramakrishna goes into Samadhi, into the ecstasy, Samadhi, M writes in Bengali, Samadhi Mandire. Now literally it means in the temple of Samadhi. And there are so many people in Belurma who come and say, where is the Samadhi Mandire? We want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> they actually, they think it's a real temple. But what it means is that every day he would go into these ecstasies and uh, experience this. So this is another aspect. Another aspect was Vijnana, which Sri Ramakrishna spoke about. He told it in different occasions. He said that when you go up in a house, 
you ascend through the stairs, you leave the ground floor behind and the first floor and the second floor, and you go to the roof. When you go to the roof, you realize what the roof is made of, the same bricks and concrete and mortar and cement and whatever, the staircase and the doors and the windows and all that you had left behind, they're all made of the same thing. Now what does that mean? When through spiritual practices we come upon an intuition of God, when God becomes a reality in that flash, that is realization. Usually religion and spirituality takes us to that. But Sri Ramakrishna says go beyond that and you see what you had left behind what you had left behind, turn back to the world again, see the people around you, see this world, you will find in that flash of realization which you realize as that existence consciousness bliss, that divinity pervades everything. That which we leave behind and realize God, when we look back again, we find the same God pervading everything. Swami Brahmananda puts it beautifully. It is Sri Ramakrishna's own words. He says, um, Coconut, has a flesh and a husk. Now the husk is of the flesh of the coconut and the flesh is of the husk of the coconut. What he means by that, this world, the God is the reality of this world and the world is the appearance of God. Right now our problem is we see the world without understanding what God is. When the person realizes God, by first leaving this world behind and diving deep into himself or herself in spiritual practice and then looks back upon the world, the whole world is flooded. Aurobindo puts it so beautifully. He says, the world drowned in the white radiance of an immortal eye. The world drowned in the white radiance of an immortal eye. The immortal eye has opened for, for a spiritual practitioner and when he or she looks back upon the world, he sees the same this, this world itself. In Advaita Vedanta also, the famous example of the snake and the rope, we say that the, it, the world is false because it's like a rope, but in reality, it's a, the rope is a snake. We have mistaken the rope to be a, no, in reality, the snake is a rope. So we have mistaken the uh, rope to be a snake. And you have to realize, it's not a snake, but a rope. But imagine, just think about it. When we are seeing the snake, at that moment, where is the rope? Where is the rope? Right there. Where we are seeing the snake, the rope is right there. This is the meaning. That where we are seeing the world, though we may not understand it, we may not intuit it, we may not feel it, right here in this experience is Brahman, is God, is divinity. The realized soul feels it. The realized soul feels it at every moment. Sees it. We do not. That's all. It's not that God is elsewhere. It's not that God is at any other time. God is eternal, so at all times God must be there. If it's there at all times, God must be here and must be now. God is omnipresent. It must be pre is present everywhere. If it's present everywhere, it must be present here also. So where the snake is, there itself the rope is. That brings us to another aspect of Sri Ramakrishna's teachings, which Swami Vivekananda understood so beautifully. One day in ecstasy he said, Jive Daya Noy, Shiva Gyane, Jeev Sheva, in Bengali. He was talking about the teachings of the traditional Vaishnavas that uh, you have devotion to Krishna and um, you serve the devotees of the Lord and you uh, have compassion for people, compassion for the suffering. And Sri Ramakrishna says, Not compassion. Who are you to show compassion? It is the Lord himself appearing in all these forms. So not compassion, but knowing the human being, the person to be God, knowing them to be God, worship God in the human form. He said that. And Narendranath who was there in that gathering, when he came out, he said, today I have heard a revolutionary thing. If the Lord gives me, the opportunity I shall preach it to the world and that's how it became the core of the philosophy of Swami Vivekananda the entire work of the Ramakrishna order and not just the Ramakrishna order so many people all over the world taking up service as spirituality serving others not as acts of doing good not as charity but as a spiritual practice so many people doing it around the world now that is the core that is the core philosophy that you are actually worshipping God 
not teaching students in a school, not treating patients in a hospital, not um, giving uh, help to the uh, poor person or the person affected by a, a natural calamity, but actually we are worshipping God. And this is transformed work. How can you transform our day-to-day -day work into spiritual practice? So the whole problem is we have this idea of a spiritual life and a secular life. So you have an office, a school, a business, and you have the shrine, the church, and the temple, and the mosque, and the Vedanta society. So that's something religious I'm doing, and this is something secular. But can I practice spirituality in the office, in the operation theater, in the hospital, in the school, in the uh, relief camp where you're helping people affected by uh, floods or other disasters? Can I do that? And Sri Ramakrishna gives us, in just this formula, transforming work into spiritual practice. And that is, that's what Swami Vivekananda did and when he spread this message. Religion, sadly enough, has been the cause of great disharmony, of bloodshed and violence. And today, it is tragic. Nobody expected it in the 21st century. You know, in the, by the end of the 19th century, people thought religion is on the wane. Religion will slowly die out. And it will peter out. Oh, I can't resist this. Uh, it's because this is Hollywood. This is this person who wrote the beautiful the play, Peter Pan. It's a very, very spiritual play, actually. <laughs> he wrote this Peter Pan. And somebody asked him, how do you feel when some of your works don't work out? You know, they, 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 they flop. Um, they are not successful. And the author quipped back, well, some of them pan out, but others peter out. What can you do? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's not relevant. <laughs> Religions have been the cause of great disharmony. By the end of... 20th, uh, 19th century people thought that religion itself would disappear. Of course, that did not happen. I remember, uh, um, you know, like Nietzsche had famously said, God is dead. I saw this cartoon in a paper. It says that God is dead. Somebody scribbled on the wall and it's signed below, Nietzsche. And below that, somebody has written, Nietzsche is dead and signed below, God. <laughs> <laughs> One of our Swamis, um, who was traveling to another country, traveling through Paris and the airport there, and, and, the, and the immigration, they asked him a question, what is your profession? And when he explained, he said, oh, you're a preacher. Haven't you heard? God is dead. <laughs> <laughs> and the Swami replied, maybe in your country. Come to India, he's living and <laughs> he's alive and kicking. <laughs> Come to India, he's alive and kicking. So, but nobody expected that we'll have an upsurge of religious violence in the end of the 20th century, in the beginning of the 21st century, in this day and age, fighting and killing people in the name of religion. Nobody expected that. But it happened. And you see the relevance of Sri Ramakrishna today. So, Sri Ramakrishna, maybe the main reason why he's known as become more and more relevant today is as the teacher, great teacher of harmony as a great teacher of harmony. His famous expression, Jato Mat Tatopat, he sometimes said Mat Pat. Mat means an opinion, a philosophy, a, a religious viewpoint. And Pat is like the English path. Each religious point of view is one path to God. And they are all true. He says, just like there's a pond and uh, the, the Hindu goes there and calls it uh, Jal, Jal in Sanskrit or Bengali, and the Muslim calls it Pani, and uh, this an Englishman calls it Aqua. I don't think an English, Englishman did actually call it Aqua, but anyhow, he must have heard that. And they are all referring to the same reality. All the religions, and he spoke from experience, he spoke from experience. All the religions are true, they are all valid, and they all lead to the same goal. So, that's, what, that's the first thing he said, and he practiced it. He practiced it in his own life with the different sects of Hinduism and the different religions which he came into contact with. And he saw in his own life that they all led to the same goal. And he said, should not fight over religions. All religions are true. Swami Ghananandaji, who was in England, 
He has written this article, he's written in a chapter in his book on Sri Ramakrishna, the sevenfold harmony. We don't have time for the sevenfold harmony, but I can just read it out. It's a very crisp bit of analysis. He says what Sri Ramakrishna has done is the harmony first, the harmony between religions, that's his greatest contribution. That all religions are true and they all lead to the same goal. You need not fight. Not only you need not fight, you can accept all other religions and learn from them too. You can learn, you can, you can be steadfast in your own path and you can learn from them. Then he says the harmony of the different philosophies, the second level of harmony between dualism, qualified monism and non-dualism. The same reality is seen as God the Lord and I'm the servant. The same reality is seen as the whole and I'm the part. God is the whole and I'm part of the divinity. The same reality is I and thou are one and the same reality. So Dvaita, Vishishta Dvaita, Advaita are all different approaches, different stages of realization. Sri Ramakrishna uh, showed with his own life and teachings. Then third, the harmony of the different ways to God, the path of knowledge, philosophical analysis, vichara, the path of meditation, Patanjali Yoga, the meditation, the path of devotion, love of God, and the path of selfless work. There is a beautiful hymn to Sri Ramakrishna which says, Advayatattva samahita chittam, projvala bhakti patavrita vrittam, karma kalevara adbhuta cheshtam, which in Sanskrit it means, his mind suffused with non-dual knowledge, clothed with the glowing cloth of devotion, love of God, and working and with a body which was, which, was, which was used up, expressed in tremendous effort in spreading the word of God, in spreading uh, spiritual truth. So work and love and knowledge and yoga, meditation also, all expressed, Swami Vivekananda says, in the highest possible degree. Swami Vivekananda says, by seeing this person, it has become possible for me to understand that a human being need not be narrow, need not be just one-sided, can be all, all sided, can be a man, of, or a man or woman of knowledge, of love, of the deepest concentration in meditation and of service. He showed us that life attains fulfillment through knowledge of God, realizing the existence of God, realizing that we are made of God's stuff. <laughs> we are divinity, I just coined that, that's nice. <laughs> we, are, we are divine, that knowledge, realizing that. And knowledge becomes fulfilled in love. And love becomes fulfilled in service. From knowledge to love to service. Jnana to prema to seva. And he, he showed that. And Swami Vivekananda expressed it in his, uh, uh, the way he set up the Ramakrishna order and his, in his teachings. So the harmony of jnana, bhakti, yoga and karma. Then the fourth the harmony between the personal God and the impersonal God. The harmony between the God with form and without form. And some people would say God has no form and it's formless. And some people would say no God has form. And there was a big quarrel. And Sri Ramakrishna asks people who come to you. Do you believe in God with form or without form? <laughs> and this is a strange question to ask. Uh, but he harmonized that and he showed that. with beautiful examples of water and ice. It's the same substance. There are when, uh, places where the water, it's so cold that water congeals into ice. So God has form. And he says when the sun of knowledge rises, the ice melts back into water. Uh, the form goes back to the formless. And it's the same substance. Water is the same substance, whether it's liquid or solid as ice. Uh, and then the fifth form of harmony, uh, Ghananandaji says, the different levels of superconscious realization, the yogics, um, nirvikalpa samadhi, the different bhavas of divine love, ecstasies of divine love, the different kinds of realizations which are attained in different paths, he harmonized that. And then he says the harmony between sects. Often you find the hatred between religions is not so much as the hatred within a religion. You see, the, the hatred between the Sunni and the Shia, or in Ireland, between the Catholic and the Protestant. Uh, so, even in Hinduism, you know, the, uh, the Shaiva and the Vaishnava and the Shakta, it's not expressed as overt violence ever. Um, one traveler 
European traveler about 300 years ago, writes a very nice account of religious violence in India. He says, at one, I got wind of a quarrel going to, be, to take place between the followers of Vishnu and Shiva. And so he went there and he saw all these gorgeously dressed gentlemen, he, he writes it. They walked up in groups and they traded insults. They hurled barbed insults at each other and then people lost their temper and they came close and a few turbans got knocked off. <laughs> and then they dusted themselves off and they went back home. And he said, he was touched. He says, this is the extent to which they can go. And he says, it just reminds me of the violence that is there within the members of a family who know they are part of the same family and they love each other and they also get mad at each other. And so it's, it's like that. But even there, the sects, there are sects and uh, there's rivalry between them. And Sri Ramakrishna harmonized the sects. That's the sixth kind of harmony. And the seventh kind of harmony says, between our secular life and our spiritual life, Sri Ramakrishna says, manhush, the Bengali word for man is manush. Manush means human. And he plays on the word. Sri Ramakrishna often does that. Manhush. Who is a human being? Man means dignity and hush means awareness. One who is aware of one's own spiritual dignity. That is the real meaning of, uh, of a human being according to Sri Ramakrishna. It works much better in Bengali, trust me. So, <laughs> manhush. So, how do you live? Sri Ramakrishna says, coming to this world and getting a human birth, one is indeed unfortunate if one does not try to realize God, if one does not have devotion to God. So, the purpose of human life is God realization. How do you live in this world? You live in this world, you see God in everybody and serve, serve them all, love them all, seeing God in them. He taught that, how to harmonize our work and our spiritual practice. So the sevenfold harmony he spoke about. He, um, Sri Ramakrishna could be extremely funny. You see, we think that religion and spirituality are such profound things and one must be always be serious. Especially in this country, you know, that people think, I can, I just, uh, sitting here and looking at the faces, all sitting grimly there, you know. <laughs> you know, I have to have a religious talk now. I must swallow it like medicine. You know, it's good, it's good for me. But if you see the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, you'll find on page after page, there are little brackets and it says, all laugh. All laugh. And they are laughing. There are accounts of Places where the young men who are sitting next to Ramakrishna, there's one young man who's rolling on the floor with laughter. He's got stitches. He can't help it. And Sri Ramakrishna used to be so funny. He would have them all in stitches in no time at all. Once in Belurmat, some of the young monks were laughing in a room uh, and Swami Turiyanandaji, the great Vedantin, he was in another room, Hari, uh, Hari Maharaj. And he heard the young brahmacharis and sadhus laughing loudly in the evening. So he was a little irritated. He went down and he scolded them. He said, have you realized God? Then what's there to make so much merry about? How come you can laugh? You're having the time of your lives. But have you realized God? And they kept quiet, ashamed, until one of them was plucky enough to point out, but Swami, when we read the gospel, we find you and everybody else laughing all the time when Sri Ramakrishna was there. <laughs> and... Swami Turiyanandaji loved it. He said, yes, you are right. Good, go on. Uh, go on, laugh, laugh to your heart's content. Wonderful, wonderful. So, Sri Ramakrishna, there's the human side of Sri Ramakrishna. It was as remarkable. One of the names given to him is Naradeva, the man god, the human divine. So, there are these two sides. You know, if you look at the, the way his disciples have spoken about him, Swami Saradanandaji writes in The Great Master, he shows the human side of Sri Ramakrishna and shows the gradual development unfolding of the spiritual giant and the divine side and both of them simultaneously. Swami Ramakrishnananda, Sashi Maharaj who was in, who established the Madras Mat and everything, he was, it's all divine, he said the human side was just a play just to transact with us, just to establish a bridge with us. He sees it in a classical avatara mode that the, the human is a leela and the divinity is always there underneath the human play. So the different disciples saw Sri Ramakrishna in different ways. As Swami Vivekananda said, 
he gave to each one of us according to our ability to absorb, to understand him. Today, we all partake in this thought. You see, we are all here in certain sense, we are all selfish, but selfish in a very wise way. We have come to partake of the best that the world can offer. Christopher Ishavur translated the evening hymn sung to Sri Ramakrishna. The best translation I've seen is the one which we, we do here, English translation. Uh, other translations are a little stilted and mechanical, but this is so poetic and so beautiful. And he translates the first line that Sri Ramakrishna is like a diamond at the heart of the universe. The, the best thing that this universe can offer us, short of enlightenment, that's there at the end, of course. But the best thing before that is this, the avatar, the incarnation of, of God, which we have in front of us now, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. So I pray to Sri Ramakrishna to bless all of us that we may partake of the spiritual bounty that he has manifested in this time, the time which, as Christopher Isherwood says, that born a child of our time, so born a child of our time, and may our lives be blessed by that. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Rupanamas